from West Flanders. Welcome to the GCN show. Welcome to the GCN show from Moscow. From the slopes of Mont Ventoux. Welcome to the GCN show. Welcome to the GCN show. This week we have got a ton of new tech with more, no doubt, to follow from Eurobike. And we ask, is the Vuelta, or the Vuelta, the most exciting Grand Tour of the year? Let's get started. Eurobike, which is the cycling industry's biggest trade show, has barely even started and we have got Simon on the way out there to bring you all of the best tech. Simon? Guys, so I'm not with you today. As you can see, I'm in an airport again, off to Eurobike this time. And it's got to be said, I'm pretty excited because we have heard that there is loads and loads and loads of new tech releases. So we'll have them all for you here on GCN. So stay tuned this week because we're going to have a tech extravaganza. Ahead of Eurobike though, we have some new tech for you. Now we feature the Power to Max NG in our unboxing video the other day, and here's Simon with some more. One of the coolest things of all is that Power to Max have actually managed to improve the accuracy down to just plus or minus 1%. Now bearing in mind the industry standard is plus or minus 2%. That is no mean feat, and certainly not to be sniffed at. Don't forget that you can win every single one of the products that we do unbox in GCN Unboxing. So if you'd like to do that with the Power to Max competition, there is a link just up there or down in the description. Yeah, announced at Eurobike today with the FSA Wii group set, Wireless Electronic, making FSA the fifth major group set manufacturer to join the market, along with Campagnolo, SRAM, Shimano, and also Rota, who of course unveiled their uh, hydraulic group set earlier in the year. Yeah, the FSA group set is particularly exciting because it's been worked on for so long, so it's really great to see it finally come to market. So we saw it last year at the Tour de France where it was marked up as a prototype. You and Dan actually got hands-on with it at this year's tour. And then finally, Dan has got to go out and go for a ride on it. Yeah, headline-wise, it's first off, it's semi-wireless. And if you look at the rear mech, it's like no design we've actually seen before. And in fact, it's quite difficult to explain. So here's Dan to explain a little bit more. It's unlike anything else currently on the market in that it's not a traditional parallelogram design. Now the chief designer of the group set, Alfredo, has been trying to explain to me the ins and outs of this design, but like many things, it was slightly too much for my brain. But what I do understand is that the movement is very similar to what you'll find in lots of robots. So we'll see how that feels out on our first ride, which we're going to do shortly. What's the time now, Matt? It's got to be time for hack forward slash Fodge of the week. You got the slash right there. I know. There's only two of us, wasn't there? 50 50 chance. First up, we've got Ethan Crane who um, has sent this one in. It says hack or bodge, and Ooh. this warrants a closer wow. look. So look at that. it's on a Carrera bike, that, that much I can tell. He doesn't have a GCM water bottle, which he should fix. Mm. And he basically looks to have made his own suspension. So looking at what were once the front forks on the Carrera, he has hacksawed those in half. He's then got some nuts and bolts and attached some sort of kind of sheet plate metal stuff. And instead of springs, he has made elastometers of what look like inner tubes. He's that got is a, that's, that's, that's sub bodge level, I think. It's inge ingenious, that's but amazing. It's, not a, it's not a hack or a bodge, it's worse than either. I'll tell you what's interesting to me, from just from an engineering perspective, is the four pivot point option. Moving on, <laughs> yeah, moving very to, swiftly. On. Uh, get Sean, and this is from Instagram. Look at this. Uh, get Sean hashtag GCN hack a basket stool perfect for the boss. It looks like it's made out of inner tubes, and that really is a thing of beauty. He's basically woven inner tubes into what looks to be a quite comfortable seat. But in addition to that, the legs of said chair are made of forks, and the backrest is a. Is uh, that's cassettes ab and rims. that's absolutely well. It's the thing of beauty. I actually feel like I'm welling up a little bit. Sean, that is very very cool. Move on. Here Scott we go. Dobson hashtag GCN hack. Wow. I thought there were some homemade rollers. They're not homemade rollers. Forgive me, Scott. They that is a bike stand and a very neat bike stand. It is too. GCN hack. Very neat. Some nicer uh, craft skills on display this week. This is from <laughs> John Higgins on Twitter. GCN hack bodge. How about this paddle mudguard combo? Now, I'll be honest with you, this is the first time I've seen this. It looks like it's been tied together with bits of flotsam and jetsam he found on a local beach. And yes. the oar looks like it's about 40 years old. So, oar as a mudguard, never seen anything like it before. That's definitely a bodge. Definitely a bodge, and I doubt very much it works. No. 
Four marks for effort though. And keep those hacks and bodges coming, unsurprisingly using the hashtag hacks and bodges. Hashtag GCN hack is on screen That's now. what I mean. So the last week or so at the Vuelta, we really got us thinking, is it the most exciting and unpredictable Grand Tour of the year? Matt, what do you reckon? Well, I think that it has delivered on, on all fronts in terms of excitement, unpredictability, as you just said, and also drama. Because let's take the first few sprint stages, shall we? First up, there's no true sprinters here at the race. So as a result, we've seen some really different riders in the mix at the finishes, and they have been quite, well, exciting affairs. And to be Janny Meersman, who's come out the quickest in those, taking stages two and five. Although it must be noted that the relatively, I guess, chaotic nature of the finales of these sprint stages has led to a few calls from some of the more high profile riders, Alberto Contador yep. being one, for the general classification time to be taken at the three kilometre to go point, which as you know, three kilometres to go on flat stages, if there are any racing incidents, then the time is taken. So if you crash in the last three kilometres, you, give them the same you time. get the leaders time. But Contador tweeted this, and you're going to have to excuse my Spanish accent here. Give it a go. Uh, reflection, teniendo en cuenta que le el 80%, sorry, de las caídas se producen en los últimos three kilometers, tanto espectáculo quiteria tomar tiempos a three kilometers de meta, which probably means that Contador is saying, why not just take the GC time at three kilometers to go on sprint stages, which means that Grand Tour riders or overall classification riders won't get involved in the sprints, which will make them less dangerous for everyone. I'm not sure I agree. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I'm not sure I necessarily agree, but to be fair, Alberto Contador has had a torrid time this year in terms of crashes, although as we discussed earlier on, he has had a few crashes you know, very, very early in the race, take the, take the Tour de France for example, but he has fallen foul of this, uh, this non-rule uh, at the Vuelta a couple of times already, but I don't necessarily think it's a good thing. I think what should be done in the first instance is making sure the last 3k are safe to avoid as many of these incidents as we can. So looking at making sure there's barriers all the way in from three kilometers and making sure they're not overly technical and also looking at road furniture as well. So let's get these finishes safe rather than taking the time with 3k to go. Back to the racing though, we've seen six different leaders of the Vuelta all before the first rest day of the race, which is incredible. We've had Peter Kenyak, we've had Michal Kvyatkovsky, we've had Dela Cruz, we've had Fernandez, we've had Atapuma, and we've had Nairo Quintana. And Quintana is on absolute fire, by the way. He is. After a lacklustre Tour de France, he's really focused on salvaging his year. And I think we've, we're now seeing the Nairo Quintana of old, because he's such an exciting, swashbuckling sort of rider. Uh, and interestingly, he's leaving his attacking, well, not, not leaving his attacking, sorry, until later in the race. He's attacked very, very early on. And add to the mix as well, he's got probably the most now, the best domestique at his disposal in the form of Alejandro Valverde, who could also be a cheeky little plan B for Movistar as well. Possibly the most qualified or overqualified Grand Tour domestique in cycling history. I know. As well as Quintana, Matt. I'm not sure I expected Chris Froome to be quite so competitive either, especially when you think of his really frenetic Olympic schedule and the fact he's off the back of his third ever Tour de France win. Do you think he's going to fade in the second week or could he get stronger? It's difficult to say. I mean, he did say before the Vuelta when I spoke to him that he didn't exactly know what to expect, didn't know exactly what his form is, but I know one thing for sure is that he will fight tooth and nail to the very, very end. But the other intriguing thing about this year's Vuelta is the emergence of, you know, some real bright new talent, in particular Lilian Kamjan uh, of uh, Direct Energie, the French neo-pro who took in his maiden Grand Tour his maiden pro win. And then we've got uh, Simon Yates who won stage six, the hilly but not mountainous stage six after a problematic start to the season. And the parkour itself, the course, really provides for exciting, unpredictable racing and racing that is in fact very difficult for teams to control, particularly in the first week. The thing is, we're not even halfway through the race yet. Uh -huh. There are very, very few flat days or stages for the sprinters left. There are five mountain top finishes remaining. And there's one time trial which is a pan-flat individual time trial, but as it comes with only three days to go, that could well be the day that Chris Froome can turn the overall around if he needs to. Yeah, so plenty of opportunities still for the race to completely change shape, but will we see a race as exciting and as dramatic as the Giro, when on the penultimate stage, Vincenzo Nibali took pink from Esteban Chavez? Actually, we want to know what you think. Is this Walter the most exciting Grand Tour of the year? If you know what to do, leave your comments down below. We've already mentioned the unboxing, but get this. We've got another competition where you can win these. And links to how to enter that competition are in the description. That's right, on a Vuelta Espana theme, if you couldn't guess from the Spanish flag, 
Rota have given us these two very nice Rota key rings. And Rota are, of course, a Spanish company who machine and anodize all of their chain rings in Spain. So there we go, a Vuelta competition on a Spanish theme. Enter now. Also, we have some winners for the Cask Helmets unboxing competition. The winners are, drum roll please, Donnie Cutting from the USA wins the pink cask helmet. And another drum roll, please. Oliver Stitterich wins the sky blue and black cask helmet all the way from Germany. Well done to you both. And for the science and sport competition that we ran last week too, the big winner is Robert Pipe. And the other four winners, your names will be on screen. Congratulations to you all. If you haven't already guessed it, with eight individual different stage winners and six different leaders of the race so far, we've found this year's Vuelta Hispania to be pretty exciting. Now, I've already mentioned Yanni Mirzman's wins and also the win of Lillian Kalmjian, but add to the mix three other riders who've also taken maiden Grand Tour victories. FDJ's Alexander Gélez, David de la Cruz of Etix Quickstep, who incidentally also uh, took a day in the red jersey, as well as Jonas van Genichten of Yam Cycling. The penultimate round of the Women's World Tour, the Grand Prix Plouet, was won by Eugenia Bujak of BTC Labiana. Bujak was part of a really strong 15-rider breakaway that included the likes of Mariana Voss and Megan Guarnier, and she launched the sprint early to hold off Elena Caccini and Joel Newmanville, who rounded out the podium. The men's race saw yet another late-season victory for the soon-to-be disbanded Yam cycling team, and it was Oliver Nason who formed part of a breakaway that eventually succeeded. He put two seconds into Alberto Betiel of Calendale Drapak, and it was uh, Alexander Christoph, who took the bunch sprint for third place, five seconds behind. At the Tour de l'Avenir, a race whose name translates to the race of the future, 19-year-old Frenchman David Godou won a stage and the overall of the race. The race, if you haven't guessed it, is an under-23 race. It's a really, really good indication of who might be a star of the future. Godou won by just 24 seconds ahead of Edward Ravassi of Italy and US prodigy Adrian Costa. <laughs> It's now time for Cycling Shorts. The first ever Chinese World Tour team will race in 2017, formed from the acquisition of the World Tour license of Lamprey Morida. Now, TJ Sports Consultancy will take over the reins and the team will be headed by former World Road Champion Rui Costa and Diego Ulissi, both of whom have ridden for Lamprey for the last few years. Richard Branson is the latest cycling celebrity to have a crash. He was cycling on his British Virgin Island when he hit a bump in the road, came off, and he says that he thought his helmet might have saved his life. He Get well soon, Richard. He certainly did, and he had to drink tea for a couple of days through a straw. Not good. Wear Not a helmet. Good. Definitely. Time for some transfer news now, and there have been some really interesting moves over the last couple of days. The most significant of which, I think, is Rafa Maika. He's joining uh, ex-teammate Pete Sagan over at Border Hansgrow, and without a shadow of a doubt, I think he'll be like a bit of a grand tour wildcard player for them. Also, former World Hour record holder Matthias Brendley is moving from the soon-to-be-defunct Yam cycling team over to Trek Sigafredo. And another rider moving from Yam is Steph Clement, the former silver medalist in the World Time Trial Championships. He moves over to Dutch squad Lotto NL Jumbo. Lucas Wisniowski goes from Etix to Team Sky, where he's going to link up with compatriots and also fellow former Etix riders, Michal Kwiatkowski and Michal Golash. That's fine. Sonny Corbrelli is a really interesting rider. We've seen him mainly racing in Italy, but he's made the move to the Bahrain Merida team, so it's going to be interesting to see how he performs at a World Tour level. Certainly will. Skull Shells, the most fun course on the pro circuit. This epic cobbles and gravel route was held in some hot and dusty conditions around Antwerp in Belgium, and was so epically insane that only 45 riders from 146 starters actually finished. Given the nature of the course, it's perhaps no surprise to hear that the eventual winner was Wout van Aert, who's world cyclocross champion. He won after he attacked on the final gravel section with around five kilometers to go. Like Matt said, this course is peculiar, it's, nice. it's fascinating, and it produces some fantastic photos. In other not racing but bike riding news. Indeed, over the weekend I took part in the Rise Above Mark Cavendish Sportif in Cheshire in England, and ahead of the ride itself, I spoke to Mark Cavendish about his chances in the forthcoming World Road Championships. Can he get those stripes back? He seems to think so. I think you look at, at the guys, especially out there in the crosswinds, the guys we've had, and then if it is still stay together, the guy who's riding in the front, obviously Steve is there. He rode like 230k of that race in Copenhagen. He's good at that, isn't he? He's good at that, yeah. So, I'm, I'm absolutely, I don't think I could go and win at Qatar, but I think we can go as a team sure. with the nine guys. We've got 14 guys to pick from realistically. Yeah. And out of them, we probably have 
yeah, nine strongest guys there as a unit, so I'm looking forward to it, actually. It's time now for Dom's tweet of the week. Yeah, Dom has only chosen one tweet this week, but it's a good one. This is from Luke Rowe at Luke Rowe 1990, who says, when you lock your roommate out, and there we have Ben Swift, compression socked up, climbing in through a very small window into a hotel room somewhere in Europe, over the kettle. It actually looks like it's somebody else's leg. It's a weird angle, but clearly Ben Swift does a fair bit of stretching because uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty, yeah, pretty flexible there, isn't it? It's a marginal gain. Matt, mate, I haven't got a watch. Do you know what time it is? It's time for GTN's Wattage Bazooka! First up, the amateur one. Last eight, take it away. And it goes to Luke Sullivan, who got in touch on Twitter, saying, I hit a max heart rate of 206 beats per minute. 206? That's very high, Luke. On a tough Strava segment. Hashtag wattage bazooka. Hashtag heart rate bazooka. Yes. Hashtag HR too high for a 13-year-old. Probably okay, Luke. Keep up the good work. And for his performance on the Legacy Cover Donga in the Walter, the pro wattage bazooka goes to Will Naro Quintana. And now over to Dan on the ground at the Walter for caption and comment of the week. Take it away, Lloydie. It's time for caption of the week now. The winner of last week's is Dom Tilson, who wrote in to say, does my berm look big in this? Well done, Dom. Get in touch with us on Facebook with your address and we'll get out a limited edition GCN Camelback bottle. Uh, this week's photo is this one of Lamprey Marida's Arashiro with his dog. I shall get you started. Bienvenidos a la vuelta a Espanol. And I will admit it's probably not Espanol and it's definitely not funny and you definitely can do better. Leave your captions in the comment section just down below. We have got three comments of the week this week. I have been put in charge of choosing them. So the first two centre around Lasty and Matt. The first of those underneath Hugh Carthy's Fuji Pro Bike. Steve Kirshner wrote in and said, Matt's really using all of those cargo pants. And yes, you're right, Steve. He absolutely is. He loves those cargo pants and has done so since he first bought them in 1987. Uh, meanwhile, T-Laps underneath How to Track Stand Like a Pro has written, was this video Lasty's idea? It seems like he spent three and a half minutes showing off his track, scans, track stand skills, should I say. And yes, you're right, he does love the fact that he can track stand and he was showing off for three and a half minutes. If you get really good at them, we might even teach you to do a no-handed one. I won't be teaching that module. Finally, under, underneath the Aero Challenge video that we put out, Tim Garland wrote, the problem some of us have with getting a higher wattage in an aero position is that we have a higher guttage. It's hard to get low and still breathe. <laughs> On the channel this week, on Wednesday, we've got some cool stuff coming across to you from Eurobike. On Thursday, we've got our top tips for young cyclists. And on Friday, it's Ask GC Anything. Saturday's pro bike is Balcomolimus Trek. On Sunday, we have got a great video coming to you from the Vuelta. It's top secret, so secret, in fact, that we ha don't actually know quite what it is yet I'm because Dan hasn't told us. <laughs> and on Monday, Dan is going to show you how to make your very own chain tool. And Tuesday? Come to GCN show, great guys, and uh, yeah, good to watch. So. It's time now for Extreme Corner. That was an extremely good intro. I know. And it is an extremely good video because 12 year old shredder Jackson Goldston showdown makes at GMBN the way down the hill in Whistler. Here he is. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't know technically what that lad did, but that was some serious shizzle for a 12-year-old. Absolutely insane. Incredible. Stuff. Anyway, from extreme corner to extreme shopping. That's right, we have got some limited editions t-shirts on sale, as modelled by yours truly, for a very limited time. And we also, finally, after years of you guys asking, have our red GCN bidons on sale, as made by Camelback. And you can get uh, this t-shirt and some other new colour permutations as well. And you can get to the shop by clicking just here. And if you'd like to find out a bit more about the FSA We Group set, we've got a playlist of our two videos about it. 
it's right there. And to see Simon unbox Power to Max's brand new NG power meter, click down there. And to subscribe to GCN, click on the globe and don't forget to share and like this video too.